Welcome to this episode of the Australian Naval History podcast series. It is a production of the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, in partnership with the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Submarine Institute of Australia and the Sea Power Centre Australia. I'm Professor Rob McLaughlin, the Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the University of New South Wales, Canberra. From September 1951 until January 1952, the aircraft carrier HMAS Sydney took part in the Korean War. Her aircraft conducted over 2,000 sorties against shore targets and 10 of her aircraft were shot down. This was the only occasion an Australian aircraft carrier took part in the combat operations. To tell us about this historic operational deployment, I'm indeed fortunate to be joined in the studio and by phone by Dr Fred Lane, who was a Sea Fury pilot on board HMA Sydney, Commodore Norman Lee, who was a firefight pilot on board HMA Sydney, and Commodore Jack McCaffrey, also a formal naval aviator and a member of the Naval Studies Group. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. First off, Jack McCaffrey, can you describe HMA Sydney? Uh, yes, Rob. Uh, Sydney was uh, an, a majestic class aircraft carrier, one of six laid down for the Royal Navy uh, in the latter stages of the Second World War. Uh, only three of them were completed, um, Sydney, Melbourne and Vengeance, all three of which actually served in, in the RAN. Uh, the ship itself was about uh, 213 metres long, um, 20,000 tonnes thereabouts, uh, displacement fully loaded. Um, it had a single um, catapult portside forward for launching aircraft. It was straight deck, um, which did limit it um, in later times because it could not operate uh, more high performance jet aircraft in particular. And uh, the RAN never had the money to apply the modification to it for an angle deck that the Melbourne got. Um, it operated uh, fireflies and sea furies predominantly and occasionally uh, helicopters as well, uh, both in Korea and, and later. Um, Sydney, um, having not only been Australia's first aircraft carrier, um, had a second life uh, once it was unable to operate fixed wing aircraft any further. And uh, from 1962 till about 1972, it acted as a fast troop carrier and uh, was better known as the, the Vong Tau Ferry for the, the 29 or so runs that it made to Vietnam carrying uh, troops and equipment uh, to and from uh, that war. Norman Lee, HMA Sydney had only commissioned in 1948, now 1951, she was going to war. What was the feel of the ship? Well, it was my first ship, I must admit. Um, it's a difficult question to answer, and, except to say that the, uh, the commander was one Victor Alfred Trumper Smith, Vice Ad Admiral, uh, uh, the ship would never have uh, done anything wrong with him as the commander, I can assure you, very much <laughs> indeed. In fact, uh, i tell an amusing story. We were meant to berth uh, starboard side two, which is the normal routine when we went, got to Korea, and it was reversed because the two carriers were alongside each other on a finger wharf, and he had the other letter bay painted out within 24 hours perfectly. So, yes, it was a very taut, well, ship. Fred, can you describe the carrier air group and some of its leading personalities mm. for us? Uh, yeah, when we uh, started the work up, there were two carrier air groups, the 20th and the 21st carrier air group, but uh, it was amalgamated the Sydney air group with three squadrons instead of two. It was uh, commanded by uh, Tony Commander Mike Fell, who rose to uh, Vice Admiral, in, uh, and he was an RNR, uh, but he also had a distinguished uh, wartime career, uh, for instance, leading the uh, fighters in a uh, raid against the Turbots, for instance, for which I think he got a DSC. Um, the carrier air group, uh, three squadrons on board the Sydney uh, for the first time, was uh, interesting. Uh, the Senior officers were generally RN on loan, and Mike Fall, of course, was one of them. There was also the CO of uh, 817 Lundberg and Apple V4808 Squadron, uh, who were also RN. The only RAN, and the most senior RAN guy in the organization, was the CO of 805, Jimmy Bowles. Um, the carrier air group uh, leading personalities we had some, well, Timmy Bowles, I guess, was the leading uh, personality um, at a mess dinner. Uh, and, but we did have some uh, excellent uh, 
pilots and observers who I think did an excellent job in, in Korea. Well, Jack, can you tell us a little bit about the aircraft in the carrier air group? Uh, well, there were 22 Sea Furies uh, between 805 and 808 squadrons and 12 Fireflies in um, 817. Um, and replacement aircraft and a lot of other air stores were also um, loaned by the RN as they were needed uh, during the deployment. Um, the Sea Fury was a single seat um, and single engine uh, fighter bomber, the last piston engine uh, fighter to serve with the Royal Navy and of course the only one to, to serve in our own Navy. Um, it had a top speed of about 450 knots, um, a range of around 1,000 miles with drop tanks. Um, for armament, it had four wing-mounted 20 millimeter cannon and in Korea, it usually, carried, it usually had 125 rounds per gun. It could also carry uh, two 1,000 pound bombs or um, eight um, 60 pound rockets under the wings depending on, on the mission. Um, the Firefly uh, was a two-seat anti-submarine reconnaissance and strike aircraft. Uh, like the Fury, um, it, could, it, it had four uh, wing-mounted 20mm uh, cannon. It could also carry bombs, 500 pound bombs usually for, for the Firefly. Um, but if it was used for ASW, which it was from time to time, uh, the bombs were substituted with um, de depth charges and, and sonar boys for, for anti-submarine work. Um, Sydney also embarked a helicopter um, in Korea. Um, for the first patrol, it was uh, a Dragonfly loaned by the Royal Navy, um, and that was used for search and rescue and also for rescue destroyer, uh, uh, sorry, for, yeah, for uh, plane guard uh, work uh, during flight operations. And for the remainder of the patrols, um, the Dragonfly was loaned by the US Navy. And um, it was involved in what became a quite famous rescue of two of the downed uh, Firefly aircrew, uh, some 120 miles away from uh, the ship, uh, and getting back in darkness with no capacity to fly uh, in, in the dark, and indeed running on fumes by the time <laughs> it, it got back on the ground. Norman, the commanding officer for the deployment he joined the ship in 1950. He was Captain David Darbo Harries. Can you tell us a bit about him? What was he you, like? You know why the Darbo? No. Ah, there was a very famous jockey, Darbo Harries, and hence Darbo for the captain, always on your back. <laughs> um, I not to, didn't get to see him that much you know, as a junior officer, except when I was forced to divert to Guam because my deck hook failed to come down and uh, I arrived back in the ship and I beckoned up to the island and uh, he gently inquired uh, uh, how did it go son? <laughs> um, a, bit, a bit worried if I hadn't got back on board um, I probably would have, eased, have to have crashed into the barrier with no hook or ditch but luckily I was within diversion range. But uh, the only other thing I'll say about him is that uh, after we'd finished operations coming back to Sydney, we didn't fly. And uh, we were, as junior officers, uh, doing watchkeeping on the bridge. And I was um, poring over the chart and uh, somebody brushed my backside and I brushed it away. And then a very firm voice told me to move away. It was the captain. <laughs> <laughs> that was Darbo Harris. <laughs> Well, Fred, you mentioned uh, the executive officer just before, Commander V.A.T. Smith, who became the first naval aviator to be the head of the Navy and indeed the, the Chief of the Defence Force. Can you tell us a bit about him? What was he like? Uh, yeah, uh, Vat Smith was uh, a legend in his own right. The, um, Vat, of course, came from uh, Victor Albert Trumper, uh, who was a close relation uh, to Vat. Um, that you could tell when he really meant something and was being annoyed because he had a shrapnel wound in uh, one of his cheeks and when it turned white you knew you were in trouble uh, he was also a great man as far as um, cleaning as Norma's uh, reminded us uh, cleanliness was next to godliness and he had a special spray painting party that would rope off uh, whole sections of the carrier uh, while his spray painting party got in there and made the ship look shiny. Uh, this to some extent meant that if you had breakfast in the wardroom sometimes you had to walk all the way forward on uh, sea deck and uh, come up forward of the island and walk back to get to the briefing room or alternatively which was dangerous 
uh, come up on the port side, walk across the flight deck, which the flight deck officer didn't like um, happening, uh, uh, to get to your briefing. Uh, Vat Smith um, uh, was an observer, which perhaps was unfortunate because he concentrated on anti-submarine uh, warfare, at which I think the RAN became pretty uh, good at, but unfortunately at the expense of uh, strike, uh, which, of course, as we found uh, since the 1950s, 60s, uh, was the way ahead as far as aircraft carriers were concerned, as far as deployment was concerned. Nice guy, but when you knew you were on the wrong side of Smith, you knew it. <laughs> Norman, can you talk about the takeoff and landing procedures on HMAS Sydney? Yeah. Uh, pr prior to uh, the embarkation of the three squadrons, we normally had a free takeoff. Didn't use the catapult, but because we had th three squadrons on board, we had to use the catapult. Now, because Glory had suffered problems with her catapult, it was decided we had to have an alternate method, and so it was RATOG, rocket, uh, rocket assisted takeoff gear which were four rockets in the case of a Firefly and Fred, I think it was six for a Fury, um, strapped to the side of the aircraft, they were jettisonable. And I remember vividly my briefing, nobody had ever done it before. Uh, I was told, son, uh, put as much power as you can on. Uh, when the aircraft starts to slip away, let the brakes off, hit the button in the side of the throttle when you see a man standing with a red flag when you get alongside him. Sorry, that's when you should fire the, the rockets. And it worked. But uh, the aircraft went off uh, uh, trying to pitch up because of the thrust line of the, of the rockets. So having to push forward. Unfortunately, the Sea Fury behind me, um, um, i trying to remember his name, Jack. He... Uh, yeah, uh, he something happened. I don't know what happened, but anyway, he talked stalled and spun in, and that was the end of uh, Ray Tog. We never tried it again. <laughs> hmm. Oh my goodness, well, Fred, were there any particular challenges to operating the Sea Fury off HMA City? Uh, well, as uh, Norm has uh, intimated, there, when only one side of your rockets fire, you end up talk stalling and yeah. going yeah. in. Um, the, was there any particular challenge with the Sea Fury? It was, um, it would have liked a bigger deck, you know, like a, a um, one of the bigger American carriers, uh, but we operated quite successfully uh, on the Sydney, I think. Uh, in those days, we used to say there were uh, two kinds of pilots, then what's gone into the barrier and then what's gone in again. <laughs> uh, I was one of the very fortunate ones never to have uh, uh, had that curse. Um, the Sea Fury, um, if you knew its limits and you were ready for anything funny like a torque stall, it had a massive amount of power with that five-bladed propeller, um, then it flew well. Uh, it was a delight to fly. Uh, it didn't do much damage. It only could, in Korea, all we carried were uh, rockets and uh, not bombs. Um, but um, it was fun, uh, it was roaring. If you kept within the limits, it was a great aircraft. So Jack, to think a little bit about why did we deploy HMA Sydney to the Korean War? Oh, what chance of mentioning the Firefly? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> like Fred, I never had a barrier in 254 deck landings in the Firefly. Mm -hmm. um, that's an achievement actually. Mm. <laughs> It was a good solid aircraft. We flew it um, uh, with two 500 pound bombs normally, it was our load plus the cannon. It was a good deck landing aircraft once you learned how to handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty heavy on the controls. As I remember coming back having been flying fast jets and with, on exchange with the RN, um, getting back into a Firefly and saying, my God, did I manage to fly this thing with controls so heavy? Mm -hmm. But it was a good aeroplane. Jack, could you talk a little bit about why we sent HMA Sydney to the Korean War? Um, yeah, Rob, I think that there were two aspects to it. Um, on the military side, uh, the Royal Navy had three carriers assigned to the war, um, Triumph, Theseus and 
then Glory in, in turn. Um, Glory took its place there um, in, I think, April 51 and would have been due to come off task uh, later in that year, probably September, October. But the Royal Navy had no other carrier to replace it with, as I think was mentioned earlier by either Fred or Norman. Um, each of the carriers had, had me uh, major mechanical problems at some, at some point. So uh, the re request was made of Australia, w w could Sydney be provided? Um, and um, th uh, there was actually some reluctance, um, b b both on the military side and within government uh, to do that here. Um, CNS, um, Admiral Collins, was reluctant because he, he didn't want to, to risk Sydney being um, put into that particular conflict because he thought there were actually more important conflicts that might emerge in the, in the near future and mm. he, he wanted the ship, uh, which was such a fundamental part of the Navy to be, to be saved for that. Um, similarly, uh, I think government was concerned. On the one hand, it didn't want to overcommit to Korea because it also thought that there were more important issues beginning to emerge. But on the other hand, um, it was in, also in the throes of negotiating the ANZUS Treaty and so it had to be seen to be making yeah. uh, a significant uh, and genuine effort. And perhaps underlying all that too, um, the, the Australian military was not actually in very good shape. Uh, none of the services w was really able to do as much as government might have expected it to be able to do because of budget cutbacks uh, and all the rest of it uh, subsequent to the, the Second World War. Norman, as Jack said, HMS Sydney relieved HMS Glory. Where exactly were you operating? Well, for the, for the Fireflies, um, we operated uh, north of Seoul and to the east, uh, the west of, uh, of Seoul. We had an area which our task was to inter interdict the area, stop all transport, road or rail. Um, I, went, I will mention later on that we actually went round at the east coast at uh, one stage. Um, we also carried out anti-submarine patrols around the ship, a uh, single aircraft, a Cobra 15, I remember that quite distinctly, a 15 mile circle around the ship, very boring indeed. In fact, my first op on the, the very first day, the 5th of October as I recall, I got an anti-submarine patrol. I was very disappointed, I must admit. Um, yes, we, uh, if I mention our bombing techniques, we started off dive bombing, uh, not very successfully. You can dive bomb a bridge, you can straddle it, you don't damage it. To, to destroy a bridge, you have to hit the abutment. So we swapped over to, to low-level bombing. Um, we effectively used our anti-submarine anti profile uh, right down on the deck, a couple hundred feet, with delay fuses, uh, 37 seconds from memory. And uh, as uh, the last in the line, you had to make certain you got in before 37 seconds. <laughs> Otherwise, you've got the CO's bombs. Clearly. I achieved it <laughs> and we became very successful in knocking out bridges and we, in the end we could knock out a bridge with one, one aircraft. Mm. Well, Jack, Norman's talked a bit about how the, the Fireflies operated. Can you talk a little bit about the overall concept of operations for uh, carriers off the Korean coast and what the command arrangements were? Well, um, the, the carriers uh, operated in pairs, so there was there was always a U.S. Navy carrier alongside either the RN or or, or the Sydney when it was there, and uh, Sydney itself conducted seven 13-day uh, patrols in its time uh, in Korea. Um, the first and last two days of each patrol would have been taken up getting to and from Kure or Sasebo, depending on where, where they were operating from. Mm -hmm. um, on, and of the nine days on patrol, uh, the mid middle day w was mostly taken up with replenishment and perhaps a bit of uh, crew respite as well. Um, of the, the actual tasking, um, it was a mix of, of offensive and defensive and in fact um, the defensive tasking generally seemed to take up about 30% of the, the total number of sorties and that would have been um, CAP, Combat, Combat Air Patrol and uh, the ASW work pr primarily. Um, the other tasking, most of it, um, as I think Norman and Fred have already alluded to, was um, interdiction of supply lines. So it was attacks against um, road, rail, um, tunnels, bridges. And uh, I think, uh, as they would well know, that, that um, taking out a bridge once didn't mean that that was it. The br many of the bridges were taken out several times. Uh, there was also a spotting for naval gunfire support, which um, they did extremely well, especially with the big gunships. Um, uh, armed reconnaissance and um, search and rescue. 
and um, quite, uh, quite often too when uh, word came through of, of a, a downed aviator, uh, everything stopped and all aircraft that were available were involved in ensuring that that guy was um, looked after until such time as uh, a ship mm. could, could uh, arrive to, to rescue him. Um, the uh, the anti-submarine work was also done, as, no as Norma mentioned, uh, and also uh, reconnaissance, photo reconnaissance. Okay. So oh, as for, uh, sorry, but as, as for the actual command arrangements themselves, um, the, the carriers were part of uh, the um, West Coast um, Escort and Blockade Group. Um, they, they worked for um, the Royal Navy Admiral, um, who uh, was the, the task force commander. And he, in turn, uh, re reported to the, ta uh, the task group commander, who was an American admiral. Now, the, the Royal Navy admiral um, had two lines of command, and as, in fact, uh, did his superiors. He also had a line back to um, his boss, who was the commander-in-chief Bari Station in uh, Singapore. And just as the American admirals had their own national command and also a line through to the UN command, which was operating mm -hmm. the, the, the war itself. So... Fred, um, Norman's talked a little bit about uh, the sorts of sorties Fireflies uh, flew, and Jack's talked a little bit about the, the general roles and missions for naval aviation, and I'll, I'll ask Norman a bit more about the Fireflies in a moment. But Fred, could you talk about the sorts of sorties that you were flying in, in the Fury? Uh, right. Somewhere between half and three quarters of our sorties were um, uh, armed reconnaissance, uh, where we'd uh, launch, uh, go out and... Uh, try and keep the heads down, um, that means you know, stopping all movement, uh, rail, uh, road uh, and military uh, in an area the size of Wales, that looked much like Wales sometimes on the map. Um, we also at the same time, if we could, did not find a target, which was the usual, uh, we had a type 2 target or a plan B to shoot up at army headquarters or an emplacement or something like that. Um, the rest of the time, uh, it was good fun doing a uh, naval gunfire support shoot. Uh, I did a, a remarkable one with um, uh, a, a British destroy a, a British um, a cruiser once, and I also observed at long range uh, the New Jersey uh, being. Um, uh, used as a 16-inch, uh, uh, what, uh, 12 shells in the air job, demolishing a uh, bridge uh, and a uh, landing place over on the uh, east coast. Um, <coughs> our inevitable sortie, of course, was capped two aircraft in the air, and um, I don't think it's well known that the uh, first air casualty to an RN or RAN aircraft happened to be a... Um, uh, sea fire on cap. Uh, unfortunately, he made an aggressive looking pass onto a B-29 and got shot down very early on in the piece. Um, we only saw close up B-29s once when I shot off at sunset to, uh, with, with my uh, glorious leader to uh, investigate what turned out to be a meteorological B-29 returning from uh, North Korea. Uh, and so naturally we'd heard about the Seafire getting shot down. We just got to closing range um, and, and kept out of his gun range, visual closing range. Um, what else did we do up there that um, was of note? Um, oh, with uh, Norm, of course. Um, one day Peter Seed and I found a, um, a B-29 co-pilot uh, in the sea uh, we'd been uh, told to look for him in a particular area. We located him. He was a... a um, uh, just had a life jacket on at the time, uh, and we called up the uh, G-dropper. And, of course, the part of the G-dropper was Norm Lee, <laughs> who accurately uh, dropped the G-dropper, and later on uh, the guy was fished out, I think, by Murchison. Norm might have more on that. Norm, would you like to talk about that? Well, I think you've just about stolen my thunder yeah. there, Fred. <laughs> um, it was a fair way north, and uh, I remember being launched. I'd never dropped a G-dropper. Got a very quick briefing how it worked. I remember very carefully t testing my cannon on the way north in case I came across some MiGs, <laughs> such as a thing of youth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the annoying part was 
uh, Murchison, HMAS Murchison, uh, which is the ship I subsequently did my watchkeeping time in, um, was standing off, couldn't get in close because the water wasn't deep enough, and they had a boat. It was a toss up between myself or the boat. And I dropped my dinghy and it worked, and just as uh, it, it, the survivor got into uh, Murchison's boat, came alongside the, the rather large dinghy, put a knife through it, and uh, deflated it, and got the, the survivor in their boat and back on board, and that was it. Um, but there was, uh, yes, it was a interesting sortie. Well, Fred, you, you've talked a little bit about uh, some of your sorties. What were the most memorable sorties for you? The most memorable sorties? Oh, uh, probably when I nearly had a go at a MIG. Um, I was having a quite little uh, shoot one day in the Chinapo estuary with Belfast, a uh, six-inch cruiser, and she was all over the place. And she was as slow as a wet blanket as far as responding to gun directions were concerned. Uh, she was distracted. And I didn't realise why until suddenly I saw these silver things flashing by uh, as I was down there about you know 500 feet uh, or so and I didn't know what they were I looked up and there were the contrails about 20,000 feet 25,000 feet above of a MiG versus Sabre uh, gun air battle and these things that were dropping around me were cartridge cases and drop tanks and stuff like that uh, eventually uh, we got back onto the shoot again with uh, Belfast and she started to behave when I saw a MiG detach and go downhill at a very fast rate, you know, from 20,000 feet down to my height, but unfortunately the closest I could get to him was 10 miles because he just went shooting north like a, like a rocket. Uh, and although we were firmly instructed never, ever to try and mix it with um, uh, MiGs, I am an uh, adherent of Nelson, you know, if a commanding officer puts his ship alongside uh, the enemy, then you know, he can't be that oh, very Fred. wrong. I tried to get up behind this thing, but of course, at 10 miles, uh, it was useless. So we came back and finished off the shoot. Belfast wasn't good that day anyway. The closest we got to the were four emplaced guns, uh, about 88 mil stuff, uh, was uh, 200 yards. So we called it a day and went back. <laughs> <laughs> Norman, you've talked about one particularly memorable sortie. Any <laughs> others? Uh, the only uh, occasion that anywhere near engaging a possible enemy aircraft, we were in a flight of four fireflies and uh, we came across a similar flight of four US Marine Corps Corsairs. Mm -hmm. And the firefly to the uninitiated could be mistaken for a um, uh, uh, Russian, Russian Russian aircraft, right? And we were going around in a circle, big circle, until finally things were sorted out, and so we never did get engaged. That was it. Yes, um, I th the most uh, interesting uh, event that stays in my mind. It was the time of the peace talks in uh, October, uh, October, I think, fifty-one, and we were sent round to the east coast of Hung Nam. Um, when you're in peace talks with somebody, you beat the daylights out of them, show them how strong you are, which was the aim of this exercise. Uh, w my flight was uh, sent detailed off with two 1,000 pound bombs, as opposed to our normal 1, 000, uh, 500 pound bombs. We had to reduce fuel and ammunition load to meet the up all up weight. And I must have been, I wondered how the bird would fly off the catapult with an extra 2,000 pounds on the wings, and it flew perfectly right. Mm. We arrived on the target, it was, which was a tunnel. We had delay fuses, uh, again, uh, skiting a bit. I managed to put my two bombs right into the tunnel and got a train, and it was a f confirmed train. Uh, unfortunately, my section leader's bombs didn't go off, but I countermined his bombs. So we had a really good, massive explosion. Now. Tell a story against myself, if I may. Yes, I was detailed off for shore bombardment with Tobruk. And uh, Belfast was the cruiser, as Fred has mentioned. The two ships were fairly close together. And we did the usual exchange of call signs, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, first rounds were fired. I made a correction to the um, the gun for where the rounds had fallen. The second time, uh, the ship said, we'll have to come closer to affect the your last correction. I looked, this is, doesn't compute. The ship was fairly close. And then the penny dropped. Are you using Willy Peter? White phosphorus ranging rounds. Well, it doesn't take much work to work out that I was ranging the destroyer on the cruiser's full of shot. <laughs> There's a sequel to the story. Um, came back to Australia at the end, did my watchkeeping time in Murchison. We invited to Brooks officers for lunch and I met the gunnery officer and he said, oh, you're a birdie. I met the biggest deviant, etc. Yeah. Good story. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fred, your squadron lost three aircraft. Can you talk about the circumstances of those losses? Oh, we lost more than three aircraft. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, no, we lost more than three aircraft. We lost three pilots. Uh, the first pilot uh, to uh, covet was my glorious leader, a um, hundred yards in front of me as we were um, uh, engaging uh, what has been described as a, um, uh, a convoy of trucks. It was one truck-like looking object that never got above more than 15 kilometres an hour uh, along a long straight uh, road and I strongly suspect it was a flak trap that uh, shot him down um, in, in his, uh, as he was falling out of his dive. Um, I, uh, so, uh, additional evidence for that was I, we were circling uh, him for about five minutes at about uh, 3,000 feet above, and I got a 20-millimeter uh, round uh, through my rudder bar uh, control uh, that very nearly severed it, uh, and it would have to be some pretty accurate kind of flak to uh, to do that. But nevertheless, um, it's my opinion that it was certainly never a convoy. It was a single vehicle. Uh, what it was doing at that speed, why it didn't increase speed as we attacked it, why it didn't try to evade, I, uh, I don't know. Um, but it has all the marks of a flak trap to me. So, Norman, our colleague Peter colleague. Goldrick was wounded at yes. one stage. Can you talk about that? Well, I remember the day quite well. As I, uh, he was hit in the right arm. Um, the round went through the side of the cockpit, fortunately through a message dropping bag, as I recall, and uh, into his arm. He then landed back on board, which was quite an achievement. Um, the ship was designed as you go to the forward lift and low down into the sick bay, right, or hospital, whatever it was. Um, this, the sequel was sequel to his uh, uh, the ev the um, event it was that uh, he was wearing pajamas under his flying suit, and uh, when he put in his claim for his pajamas, uh, he was, there was a query as what was he doing flying with pajamas under his flying suit in those days. Could I go back to the flak traps? Uh, my section leader and myself were uh, doing a road recce and uh, my CO and his number two were somewhere else and we heard the CO come up with, uh, uh, found a truck tacking and my section leader was an old Beaufort bomber pilot from the Second World War, very experienced. He looked across at me and winked. And uh, sure enough, very short after, I've been hit, I've been hit. And um, he uh, managed to get back to the ship. We'd been hitting his fuel tank, so he's losing fuel. And uh, we had a lot of ex Air Force people on board who were air crew who joined after the war. Pretty tough old bunch, some of them. And they were taking bets as whether he'd make it back to the ship or not, which he did. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> Fred. HMA Sydney experienced uh, snowstorms and even a typhoon during the deployment. What was it like trying to conduct flying operations in these situations? We didn't. <laughs> we didn't, no. <laughs> it was simple. We um, uh, battened down the hatches and uh, sat and waited until it uh, uh, went away. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, we did lose um, a number of aircraft in Typhoon Ruth, mm -hmm. uh, which killed 500 ashore in uh, Japan. Uh, and the ship was only saved by Darbo Harry's uh, 
uh, taking the decision to get the hell out of the crowded yeah. uh, anchorage that we were in. It and like. it was a correct decision because an American trooper dragging her boy came right through our anchorage yeah. and would have collected us uh, on the way. She ended up on the beach. Um, also, uh, Sydney's uh, aircraft in the hangar never got damaged. And one of the main reasons I think they didn't get damaged was because they battened their, uh, their chocks. That you know, put a bit of wood either side and hammer it in place so the chocks don't move. On the flight deck, we only roped the chocks instead of uh, battening them, and that allowed them to move backwards and towards. Of course, they were subject to much more wind effect up there uh, and spray and all the rest of it. But um, this was um, uh, part of the deal. This is when, you, when you operate aircraft and you've got a deck park, uh, you've got to think about these things and um, uh, act accordingly. Uh, one of the act accordinglys that I wouldn't recommend is was regard uh, young um, pilots and uh, air crew uh, were at one stage roped together uh, five uh, in a, on a long rope uh, and we would go out and relash any aircraft that looked um, mm. uh, as though it might uh, get loose. Uh, I'm not sure whether that did any good or whether it contributed to the problems. Um, no, we did not fly in bad weather. It, Could I just add to that yeah. that uh, we had numerous fall fires throughout the night. Uh, pipes were being made, uh, the standard pipe, no smoking on the flight of weather decks. You couldn't even stand on the flight of weather decks. Um, we lost a, a tractor forward of the bridge, the, uh, forward of the island. The flight deck is 44 feet above the water. We lost a boat for after. It was pretty rough. But anyway, all these small fires were water getting into trunking and uh, short-circuiting mm -hmm. motors, right? Mm -hmm. And one pipe, I remember distinctly, and we young officers were accommodated forward in the plant, what was colloquially known as the Casbah, and what the pipe was, fire, 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 fire in the bomb room. And we all looked at each other because we were sitting right over the top of the bomb room. <laughs> and I've been asked, what did you do? And we dealt another hand of <laughs> cards. <laughs> Jack? Oh, yeah, just to make the point that, um, Fred talked about the, the damage to aircraft on the deck. The deck park was actually bigger than would normally have been the case simply because there were three squadrons Squadron on board, board. And so they couldn't all be kept uh, down below. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if I, if I could uh, amplify a little on that um, uh, flight deck problem, at one stage we saw, or I saw, a, uh, a Sea Fury uh, that had broken its undercarriage and was lying on top of um, one of those loudspeakers uh, that uh, adorned the deck. Mm. And uh, it had a drop tank that had been pierced and this uh, 95 or 100 octane fuel was uh, dripping down over this loudspeaker, this tannoy, that was sparking. And I was expecting at any minute the whole damn thing to go up. All we could do, well, we tried turning off the electricity um, to it, but um, there was no way we could isolate this damn thing, and it kept on sparking, sparking, until the um, tank went dry. Fortunately, it didn't ignite. Goodness. Perhaps it was too cold. Well, Jack, HMA Sydney had a most successful deployment in the 2000 mm. sorties, but she never went back. Do we know why? Well, she didn't, and she did. Um, she didn't during the war, and, and I think there was really no expectation that she would. Uh, was she was filling a gap in the first instance in the, the Brit carrier rotation. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned previously too, that neither the Navy nor the government was all that keen on the ship going in the first place. So th th there was certainly no enthusiasm for, for sending it back. Um, but um, uh, Vengeance um, uh, was loaned by the Royal Navy to uh, the RAN at the end of, or late 1952, um, as a stopgap while Melbourne was being converted mm -hmm. with Angle Flight Deck. And one of, I think one of the conditions was that Vengeance would deploy to Korea. Um, as it turned out, Vengeance didn't go, uh, and Sydney did go, but, but it was after the armistice. It was from, I think, December 53 um, till about May 1954. Yeah. Well, to conclude, can I ask each of you if you have any final thoughts about Sydney's deployment? And we might start, Fred, with you. Any final thoughts about Sydney's deployment? Uh, yeah. Yes, I think um, Sydney, 
went up there and we learned a lot. Although all the uh, senior uh, air people were RN or RN on loan, uh, they did uh, perform well, in my opinion. I think the, the um, ops people particularly, they had a pretty difficult task sometimes sorting things out. Uh, the uh, commander air, uh, Kidgel, uh, I'm sure he contributed. Uh, Mike Fell, certainly. Uh, as the CAG commander uh, contributed well. And we learned a lot up there. Did we do as well as we possibly could? Uh, maybe we did with the aircraft that we've got. Remember, uh, I said that was, that Smith was uh, ASW oriented and uh, it seems not much thought was given to the strike side. Had we an aircraft such as the AD SPAD uh, of the uh, USN uh, at the time uh, that could carry torpedoes and uh, do other um, wonderful things with bombs and whatever, uh, I'm sure we would have made a much uh, better mark. Um, we certainly uh, seemed to stop all traffic in our particular area, but it cost us a lot. It cost us uh, uh, 10 aircraft shot down it, it cost us three pilots killed from 805 Squadron. Um, overall, it was an excellent blooding experience for the RAN, I think, and operating an aircraft carrier. We learned a lot, uh, but it hasn't been put to any use after that. Norman Lee. Yes, a couple of points if I may. Both my course mates were shot down on the same day, one in a Sea Fury, one in a Firefly. Uh, the amusing thing is that uh, the Firefly was, of course, made blue, um, Blue Macmillan. When he got back on board, he had a cut in his forehead. And I asked him, did you hit the gun side for uh, blue? No, he said, I was so keen getting in the chopper, I didn't look what I was doing, I belt bent ahead. <laughs> in, the, in the case of the Sea Fury, he ditched in the hand, and uh, fortunately the crack drop tank came off and put him on the south side of the, the hand crashed through a stone wall, broke up the aircraft quite badly. He wasn't hurt at all. He, it's true, he sold the aircraft to the locals for so many won and came back about a week later still flogging his parachute. But one final story, if I may, about Sydney. There was a young sailor doing a, a check on a firefly in the hangar and uh, he was checking the guns and he made all the safety movers, but, right. but then he realised he needed a tool and he went away to get the tool, came back, got in the aircraft, pressed the firing button whereupon the cannon fired. He'd got on the wrong aircraft. In the case of the Firefly, it wings folded back like that and the cannon were pointing up and the rounds went through the flight deck and uh, my squadron CO and the station, the uh, ship en engineer officer were doing their evening constitutional it missed them by a few metres, but there it is. Sydney, the, where the rounds went through the deck, was a little plate welded into the deck. When I was the captain of the port of Sydney, I had Sydney under my control in reserve, and I went aboard and the place was still there. <laughs> <laughs> Jack McCaffrey. Um, well, Rob, as someone who uh, has only read about um, the Fleet Arrow in, in the Korean War, uh, so I certainly come away with the sense that the ship and, and the squadrons did extremely well um, with the aircraft that they did have. Um, and it, I guess it's just a little, at least disappointing to see that that operational excellence really didn't amount to very much when you think that a mere seven years later, the government decided it didn't need a fleet arm anymore. Mm. Quite so. Can I just make one point? I thoroughly enjoyed it and I got a gold card. <laughs> well. Sadly, that's all we have time for today. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And my particular thanks go to Dr. Fred Lane for joining us from Sydney, Commodore Norman Lee, and Commodore Jack McCaffrey for their participation in this episode of the Naval, Australian Naval History Podcast. For information about the series, please visit the Naval Studies Group website. Thank you. <laughs>